All right, all right. Just getting some final things ready. Okay. Start that countdown. Mic test, y'all can hear me okay? Awesome, thank you, Negihama. Alrighty. Yeah, if at any point my voice turns into a robot, um, which is what I was troubleshooting before the last stream, let me know. Hello, my friends. Um, welcome back, or hello for the first time. Regardless, I am excited for episode two um, in the introduction content, just sort of getting a feeler for uh, what InfoSec is about and maybe some habits that'll help us learn it a little bit quicker. Uh, just because if you're going to be putting time into learning something, uh, might as well be equipped with some mind weapons, mind, something with your mind, but equipped with things that help you uh, ingest that content and really stick it in there as much as possible. So, uh, let's hop to it. Uh, so, f this lesson is called Learning How to Learn, which I basically learned most of from a wonderful course that will be in the slides um, afterwards. Actually, I'll show you where it will be on the website. Um, by this lady, Barbara Oakley, who did a, made a book called Mind by the Numbers and then made this course for free on Coursera that you can take. Um, it's only like two hours of content a week for four weeks and do it at your own pace. And uh, it's really great. So I wanted to sort of distill some of the juiciest bits here for you, but we'll also recommend you check it out. So you can see my slides there, but just so you know, on my website, seventhdirection.com, trying to keep the name the same everywhere, if you click on the curriculum, not only will you see these classes and be like, oh, what's coming up? Building habits, how exciting. Um, also, what will be in season two, but at the night before, usually, or just a few hours before the stream, I... Uh, up an article with the links I'll be covering at the end of the class, as well as what I call research projects, just to get you in the idea of like projects, like writing something, making something out of your learning, um, because I feel like that's one of the best ways to really solidify something. So if you have the extra time, I don't think it's super important, but if you have the extra time to dedicate towards doing little projects, I think it's a super great way to uh, know what you know, or, or harden what you know, because I, I was teaching this class originally for two years, and I think that just by the act of teaching, I think it really helped me. So the idea is, if you make an article, uh, then we can share it with people on the stream, we can talk about it on the, the chit chats at the end of the month, and, uh, and yeah, I would love to see what y'all produce in this, in this vein. Uh, so we'll talk about that at the end, regardless. Here's the slides. I think I figured out the slideshow format, so it will... All right, so learning how to learn. So, um, yeah, like I said at the beginning, I thought this was really important because this is... There's all this, like, fascinating research on, like, cognitive science and how brains learn and how they work that I don't think has been really ingested into the teaching format. I think a lot of really good teachers intuitively are doing this, um, but a lot of it isn't sort of made plain um, 
aspects of the teaching process or the learning process, excuse me, and how our brains ingest information and how we can make our brains work for us a little bit better. So we're covering three things uh, in three parts. Uh, Barbara Oakley doesn't go super heavy into learning mindset. She does mention it, but I think, uh, to me, I think that's really important. Um, and what I mean by mindset is sort of just how you approach learning, uh, which is, it's kind of like a narrative about yourself and like the lens with which you see the world has a huge influence um, on how your brain actually ingests that information. So I think uh, thinking about our mindset and uh, working to sort of foster and curate good thoughts about our mindset will definitely help us with all the learning we do past that. Uh, second part will be on the, the sort of functional aspects, how the brain do what it do. And then lastly, we'll cover the techniques from Barbara's class, which to me, I've instituted just a few when I remember to do them. And I can definitely say that they have been helping me quite a bit. So first off, learning mindset. And as it says there, if you change your mind, you can change your brain. And that is super true. I mean, just with meditation, emptying your mind will change your brain. Um, but we're, we're going to be putting stuff in there. So if, if that's going to be happening anyway, we might as well be, uh, trying to think about how we can best sort of serve our interests if we want to learn something and grow and change. So first I, I kind of wanted to just make really plain that I think, I think there's this like subtext running through traditional education that really never gets questioned that there's sort of like, there's the teacher at the front of the class. They've got all the knowledge in their head. They're going to talk and show slides and then put their knowledge out of their head. And then I'm going to take it from those things and put it into my head so I can regurgitate it and sort of like apply it on command kind of. But I think that's e even if it's not explicitly said that way, it's kind of how things are sort of, set up. And I think there's, there's really an opportunity to switch to a mindset where you are the, the thing that learns the things and you're going to do it different than the person sitting right next to you. And you're going to do it different from the teacher. So if the teacher just sort of shows you some paths that you could maybe, or, or like some tools to carve paths that maybe you can take and use yourself and go do problems and solve problems on your own. I think that idea of people finding their own solutions is going to be a lot more helpful than the teacher being like, here is a laundry list of solutions. And when you know all of these, as well as I know all of these things, then you will be uh, like me and have uh, be showered with praises and money and all those things. So to all that to say, you are your teacher. I'm just a person and maybe a facilitator. I'm just sort of like collecting things I think are cool and helpful and things that I've noticed have worked for me. I would love to hear things that you find that are like helpful, not only in InfoSec and cybersecurity, but even just life in general. Cause like, as we talked about in the first episode, that like we are systems too. And so like, I always find, you know, new systems that I can incorporate into my brain and how, how I work and how I connect things together, the, the more systems I have sort of m made available to me for me to sort of think about and ingest, I think, you know, everyone's going to have a different set that is going to be really helpful for them. It's kind of like that, uh, I think it was over the arch at the Oracle at Delphi, uh, know thyself. Um, cause ultimately the stuff is coming in you and then you're learning it. <laughs> it's not just something you learn and put in and then th that it's learned. So I'm excited to hear about how some of y'all teach yourselves. Um, real quick sip here. So something that was really helpful for me was to sort of have a course or like a direction to point at. Um, because I think when the direction is in place, you can sort of draw yourself to it, uh, to some degree, or at least having the direction there, you know, where you can go. Um, but also like you can think about what you'll have when you get there. And, um, so really what I'm trying to ask is what drives you? Why is it you're listening to a pink haired lady on the internet about cybersecurity? And even though we haven't gotten too much into that, but, uh, 
thinking about why you want to possibly pursue cybersecurity. It may just be for the love of the game, but also I think, you know, for me, I mentioned this in the first stream, it was money. Like my, my buddy was talking to me and he said $40 an hour to start and, and, uh, $65 after three years in the business. And I was, I was so tired of not having money that that was the driver. And even though it sort of like waned and waxed, um, ultimately I was just like, I want to have money. So I feel comfortable because I just not having it is anxiety inducing. And I'm sure we all know that feeling. Um, so to have a career where I don't feel that nearly as much is wild. And I never thought, you know, five years ago, me never saw it in the, in the, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a drive to escape all that. So, so to talk about what drives us, um, he's talking about motivations. So there's intrinsic and extrinsic and no value judgment on either. They're both great. Uh, whatever gets you to ultimately do the thing. There you go. That's great. So intrinsic motivations, we're talking about sort of like internal drives. So I've got listed here, curiosity, passion, and growth. These are sort of just like, just for the sake of doing them, you kind of get lost in just doing the thing. Like, um, when you're just sort of peeling something apart, just to figure out how it works, you can sort of get lost in time just being like, Oh, this is fun. And then time passes and you're like, wow. And I learned something great. So if you can, if you can figure out what your internal and intrinsic motivation is, that is one piece of the puzzle. I think for me, it started with extrinsic, uh, motivations, money right there at the top of the list. And then I found, I was drawn initially by money. And then as I was learning it, I got, then I ended up being curious and passionate and growing. And I was like, well, okay. I, I mean, great. But as long as you can find something to sort of point yourself at and be like, yes, I want that. It's going to be really helpful when just sort of the grueling nature of learning something, because to be competent at something, you just kind of have to do it a lot. And it's really just time spent in a space with a, with a mindset of learning. So that's what I'm trying to get across here. Uh, so to jump next is into mindset and, um, I don't know, psychologists, some people have sort of divided it into a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. A fixed mindset kind of has the idea that, uh, like you're kind of what you are and that's kind of what you'll always will be. Um, you're, you're only so smart. You're not going to get any smarter. You're only so talented. You're only so strong. You're only so et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And unfortunately this really doesn't help when you're trying to learn something. And I mean, I get where that comes from, but I mean, I feel like a lot of it is we just have, if we are eternally recreating ourselves, if our momentum is just to keep ourselves the same, then that's, what's going to happen. Um, it's not a judgment. It's just, uh, you know, we, it, and we alternate between these two modes, I think, but what they've found about fixed mindset learners is that they generally avoid challenges. And those are one of the best ways to help you learn. They may think effort is pointless, uh, so that they're not, you know, they don't think they can get smarter or ingest this new thing or like, you know, uh, change much of who they are. And so the effort is wasted and they often see criticism as criticism as an attack. And it makes a lot of sense because if you have a fixed mindset, you're like, Oh, I'm this smart. So if someone appears to be challenging, that I'm smart with what I said or what I did or uh, what have you. It's like, then they're challenging me as a person, not my work or, or the thing that could be improved, but we don't, it's, it's harder to see that when your ego is sort of attached to that mindset. And then on the other hand, we have the growth mindset. And, uh, I mean, this, this is life steel. It grows, it changes. Um, it's always mutable. And, uh, I think, oh, it didn't. So, with a growth mindset, you're sort of expecting challenges. You're like, well, yeah, that's how I'm going to grow. The, the seed has to embrace the soil and, and work towards the light as their motivation. Everything, uh, is going to be challenged. And that's actually a lot of how, um, you know, we have immune system responses and, and challenge often rewards pathways that reward effort and sort of, re um, accomplishment. So it's, it's a, how our problem solving brain likes to solve things. 
And so as you apply more effort, eventually you may achieve mastery. Oh, it's over here. Mastery. Um, and I, I really like the, the, the criticism distinction because um, criticism as feedback. That's a really cool way to, uh, to look at uh, criticism. And uh, yes, uh, we're all still going to want to jump down someone's throat when they critique something we've done. But I think I, I really lucked out um, in art school. Uh, my second year, a close friend of mine, um, he was critiquing a drawing that I was doing. And in art school, critique crit, critique is uh, kind of expected. Like, oh, what what could you do better, et cetera, so forth. So it really helps sort of own that skill. But he was taking a drawing I was doing. I was like, oh, well, it's not in perspective, so it's wrong, you know. And I was like, oh, well, uh, excuse me? And and more for clarification, not like, how dare you, but it's wrong? Like, what what do you mean it's wrong? He's like, well, I mean, it, it's it's not in perspective. And he drew, like, a sphere of my character's head with a, with a line on where the eyes should sit if it was purely in perspective. And it was a mind-blowing moment to me that I had been taking perspective classes and, like, seeing, like, oh, the vanishing point, sure, you draw from here to there, and, yeah, you make boxes, and it's kind of boring. But it didn't really click that if my brain sees something on the page that isn't in a fixed perspective, which is how your brain is at all times, like your eyes are stuck there, it knows it's wrong. And so like that, that was a huge mindset shift for me and uh, really helped me start getting better at drawing once I realized, oh, I have to do things right <laughs> to, and be competent to ultimately uh, get a job in the career when I graduated. The, the piece of paper shows I may have the skill sets, but it doesn't show competency. Me drawing a drawing that is a good drawing <laughs> shows competency. So I think, I think that can be really helpful to think about criticism as something that helps us. And uh, the last thing I wanted to cover here was something they call the locus of control. And so the internal locus of control, uh, it, it basically means like how you think uh, you and life affect each other. So if you have an internal locus of control, you're like, I am in control of my destiny. I can make steps towards changing things. And, uh, it's just a much more active, uh, perspective around things. So you take responsibility for your actions, less influenced by opinion and what they found generally better learners. And I mean, it kind of makes sense that like, Oh, I can do this. And it's not subject to the whims of fate. And granted, there are things in whims of fate, you know, where we were born, how, our class and our race and gender and etc. and so forth. There are systems of, that we cannot necessarily make big old changes right away, but it's important to recognize what we can change and learning is one of those things we can definitely do ourselves. So the external locus of control generally thinks of things as fate or luck uh, for when success happens and blame outside forces for failures and f ultimately feel powerless to change situations. So I understand that uh, there are things out there that can make us fear feel powerless. Um, but I think one of the coolest things about learning is that that, you know, we can, we can try and trim as many external forces as possible. And that is something in our control. And then we can take control from there and uh, see where we go. So that's the mindset stuff, which I think is really important. I mean, obviously I waver in this every day, <laughs> how I feel about things in general. But, uh, you know, I, tr I, I realize that one perspective has a lot more benefits and I try and curate my thoughts more towards those uh, lenses when I can. And so now we're moving on to the learning brain, which I think is super fascinating. And you should absolutely take Barbara Oakley's wonderful free class on Coursera to really get into this. But I just wanted to cover it uh, just to get an idea of, you know, thinking about how we're going to be learning while, while we are doing so. So uh, there's two major types of thinking. And I mean, I think you might be able to infer just on the name focused thinking or diffused thinking. So focused thinking is really the, the literal brain burning, staring at a problem, trying to solve thinking 
um, that is burning calories. Like it actually like uses bodies, the body's resources just for thinking. And, um, you know, this is solving problems, uh, taking tests, uh, doing something, uh, you're not quite familiar with. I think the unfortunate thing is that as a beginner, you you generally have to spend more time, or uh, it's reversed, more time in focus thinking because you're unfamiliar with the concept, so you don't even know how to relax and enjoy the thing you're doing uh, or enter a diffused state. Um, but oftentimes you can switch to um, something that might be easier that you've done before, but it's good still to practice. So that might be like... Uh, typing or uh, going through a, a, an exercise that's guided rather than trying to solve something yourself. Um, but diffused thinking is is just... Uh, it's diffused. It's just... The, the cool part about it is is that rather than these sort of binders on your thinking, like when you're focused about something, you're narrowing in on a problem set and just trying to use what you know about this, but in diffused thinking, other parts of your brain are lighting up and sort of like randomly, question mark, offering sort of thoughts and memories or sparking in conjunction so it can create connections between something you're learning in a focused mode and stuff that you already know. So um, being able to switch between the two can really help uh, your brain, especially because diffuse thinking generally doesn't... Uh, it uses less calories, so you're, you're not burning your body's energy. So when you come back to focus thinking, your brain has spent some time just sort of floating around, and uh, now you come back focused, and you may have some interesting connections that you might not have found. Um, Barbara Oakley mentions the, how Einstein uh, came up with the theory of relativity. Uh, him and a bunch of, bunch of famous mofos, Thomas Edison... Uh, did this, uh, Salvador Dali did this thing where they would think about a problem or an art project or something they were doing, and then they would lay in a comfortable chair with a spoon hanging off the, the hand rest, and then just sort of close their eyes and sort of like try to go to sleep. And you get that weird hypnagogic state where you see in just imagery pass. And then when the spoon dropped and clattered, they would wake up and sort of just like go right back into focus because their brain had just made all sorts of interesting connections as it was drifting off. And then they would dive back into a project and they would, they would come back at it with a bunch of renewed sort of insights. So I thought that was pretty cool. I haven't really done that myself, but it sound, I mean, all these smart people do it, so I probably should. Um, next is we're going to cover the working memory and the long-term memory. So for this part, I think I'll do a doodle. Um, okay. Uh, let's go full screen ahead. All right, so if we've got, uh, well, let's say Jane is over here. Jane is so excited about learning cybersecurity. Um, so let's look inside Jane's head. So let's say this big thing is ugh, not a great circle. There we go. Uh, that's, that's her memory in general, working and long term. But let's carve out a little section, uh, a little wing of the long term memory library. And uh, let's put the actual working memory inside of there. Ooh, ooh. And then here's our long-term memory with all these little books on assorted things and TV show theme songs and lyrics to cartoons and all that stuff. So there's that. And inside here, let's call this triangle within the diamond the working memory. And let's give it another color. So here's our working memory inside of that. Let's zoom in. I love having Control Z. Only life had Control Z. Um, so here's our, let's make that our working memory. And here's our long-term memory. So how do they sort of work together? Well, let's consider. There's this article on the internet about hackers 
you're like, oh, gotta read that cool article about hackers. Yeah. And it's got a bunch of information that the author has sort of made themselves from their long-term memory and probably some focused thinking on, you know, doing research and stuff. And so we want to ingest what's in this article into our long-term memory. So first off, we're probably bringing something we know about computers or something with us. Um, but the thing about the working memory is it can only hold four bits of information at a time. And I'm not entirely certain what that means. That's how uh, Barbara described it. But the idea is that you can really only hold four general concepts. So computers, maybe, I mean, you know more than just that they exist. You've dealt with them before. And so you kind of have a little spiral of thoughts that you have compressed into this one bit. So when you think about computers, you're thinking about it is a, you're thinking in systems. You, there are some systems you're familiar with, even if you can't describe them. Um, so that bit comes with a little bit extra. When we're looking at an article, we are not able to see all the sort of bits the author is coming with when they present this surface level thought. But we've got to work with it anyway. So we throw that into our working memory and we don't retain it quite as well as the form it came out. But we've got something to work with. And so now we're taking that back into our little working memory shelf. And then we bring it into this section of our library. Now, as we all know, everything we don't we experience, we don't remember. <laughs> and that's because uh, the brain has to do some pruning. Um, it does it when we sleep. Uh, we actually produce toxins while we're awake. So sleep sort of clears that out. And it sort of looks at what's what's been in the sort of recent memory and sort of like, well, I won't throw it out quite yet. We might need it. Uh, so we might keep it around so we can use it in our working memory. But if we come back and read another article the next day, and it's got some of the, we got similar concepts. Well, we can bring that back from this section of the library and bring that into our working memory and sort of build even more knowledge about that concept. And once we bring it back to this part, the library is keeping track of which things are popular, what's sort of happening, what should go into the long-term collection. And so the, law, the more you bring those things back, the more your brain is like, oh, okay, I should probably bring these in to my long-term memory and start storing it there. If you just do it once, you might bring in a few words, but you know, then you're bringing in pages, then you're bringing in books, and then you have those things on hand so that you can use these in your working memory at any time. So I thought that was super fascinating, especially about how each bit can sort of like the more, like you can just build on these little tails of information. So even though you're bringing in the concept as one bit, you're compressing a bunch of information about other things sort of with it and underneath it. So when you bring it to a working state, you can play with it with, with so many nested concepts sort of brought into it at the same time. I thought that was super duper fascinating. And so, yeah, that's the, my sort of breakdown of the working and long-term memory. So, whoops, where were we? Yeah. So back to slides. Uh, so last part of the lecture, I told you in the last class, I would tighten down the lecture. We're only 27 minutes in way better than last time. We've only got a, a few slides left here. Um, so lastly are some proven tools and strategies, like literally things you can do um, to help you learn. And this is also mostly from her class. Um, the first one is kind of a mindset thing, but it's more like thinking about how we're going to act. And I've got that described here as action before motivation. Um, so what I mean by that, I don't want to butcher this quote either. Ah, so what I mean by that is, you know, setting our motivation is good. Setting a direction for our carrots to start chomping in that direction. But ultimately, it's, you're, you're going to learn much more if you just start doing the thing 
and not waiting for the motivation because the motivation is fickle, um, especially with what's going on in your life, how busy you are. Um, taking action is far more important and will actually cause more motivation to happen uh, just by the nature of doing it because you're sort of setting up your brain's reward pathways to be like, oh, she does this all the time. I guess I should, you know, make her want to do it. <laughs> So it, uh, like the idea is, uh, when I was drawing, you know, it was like, well, draw at least five minutes a day, because if you don't put in that five minutes, you're not going to put in 20 minutes on a, on a good day when you are motivated and you're only going to get motivated by putting in the five minute days. So it's a bit of a catch 22 chicken before the egg kind of thing. But, uh, that's the idea is to just put time toward it. And as long as you're putting a little something, some action, the motivation will sort of curate at the same time. Um, and another helpful mindset thing, ooh, William James, love William James. Action seems to follow feeling, but really actions and feeling go together. And by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. So true. Green Jenny, thank you. That's brilliant. Oh, and it reminds me of the quote I wanted to uh, say of uh, Aristotle. Um, well, it was misattributed to Aristotle. A, a scholar talking about Aristotle made the quote, We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And I think that's a really good way of thinking about things, and definitely a growth mindset. Like a fixed mindset might think, you know, oh, we're excellent or we're not. But ultimately, if we are what we do, then we are our habits, and we should make good ones. Wow, Green Jenny, that was brilliant. Thank you. Billy Durant, yeah, wow. Jenny, coming in with the, the quote game. Thank you. So uh, uh, sort of along those lines um, is is something that really has helped me. This, this particular technique has made my learning life a lot easier. And that's thinking about uh, product versus process. So what uh, Barbara meant in the course by this is it's really tempting to think about tasks and things we have to do as the products. What, what is the end thing? As in like, clean the house. Uh, that is a lot of work. <laughs> but if we think about process, where we're like, spend 20 minutes cleaning. That, on the other hand, is so much easier for your brain to digest and start setting up a carrot reward system um, versus cleaning the house which you start thinking about all the different parts of the house, all the different things you have to do, rather than just focusing on, like, if I just put in, uh, let's just do 20 minutes of cleaning. Um, I found this to be super duper helpful. Um, I even I even did this last night to prepare for this class because I didn't have the slides all the way done. I didn't have the Kahoot quiz all set up, etc. cetera, so forth. So um, I was like, oh, I'm going to put in 30 minutes and then I'll do the rest tomorrow. But then I started 30 minutes and I was like, well, I can just... I'll put it in another 30 minutes. And then total, I put in two hours and got everything done. So when I woke up today, I didn't need to worry about that. And I could play Portal 2. Um, but yeah, that has been one of the best techniques um, from Barbara's class. So I highly recommend it. And then we've got some additional... Oh, the slides get wonky sometimes. But I figured out I can just go back and forth and it, it fixes itself. So um, one of the techniques uh, that she recommends... Oh, God, it's being wonky. Is to look ahead. And, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. If, if you're digesting something big, sometimes it can be helpful to literally just look ahead. Scan some of the chapter headings if it has them or pictures so that your, your brain sort of has a scaffolding. So when, when you're reading the text fully, you're sort of, when you approach the scaffolding, you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. And you sort of are building connections towards something you saw before in a way that really helps your, your, your brain connect all these pieces together. Because sometimes it can be really hard to keep the thread when there are a zillion threads um, available with technology. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, building a map of higher level connections before we get lost in the weeds. And then the second one, I am just going to talk about this one all the time and remind you to do it all the time because I've found it to be so useful. I thought I had a terrible memory, and I think it's just that I had bred out the act of recall. And that's literally just spending a moment after you ingest some information literally just sit and think, do a little focus thinking. What did I just ingest? I think, 
you know, with Netflix starting five seconds after an episode ends before you see the credits, it's like, it's, it's hard to sort of prime yourself to stop and pause and just sit and recollect. And like, Miss Oakley has told me that they've performed studies that this is a far better uh, long-term remembrance technique than uh, reading the same thing over and over and over again. So, proven best way to remember information. More than rereading. Uh, next is a really interesting one, uh, is the Memory Palace. Uh, if you haven't heard of this one, it's super cool. Uh, even people that are go into memory competitions, which are a thing, um, this is one of the most common techniques and what a lot of them get started with. So basically, you're connecting things you don't know with things that you do. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to think of a place that you know very, very well. Uh, maybe a childhood home, maybe your current home, maybe your workplace. Just regardless of place, you can see every part of it. You could walk through it in your mind, and it doesn't have to be a perfectly clear, but you can walk through that space and sort of see various parts of that, that place. And you can sort of build a path through it. So then the idea is to take something you're trying to learn that you're having trouble remembering, um, like let's say, the incident response life cycle, or the layers of the network, uh, the seven la OSI layers, seven layers of the OSI model. <laughs> uh, see, I should probably memory palace myself on this one. But regardless, the idea is to walk through that pathway and attach each one of those things to part of that that mind space. So for me, I have there's this rock outside of our my childhood home, my parents' home, that has been there since I was born. I don't think it's going anywhere. So there's that rock, so I could place something on that rock, and then there's the front door. Um, so I can place something on the front door. You could you could make it text. I think um, she recommended, and I've heard this before, that it's it's more helpful to think of an interesting situation or like a wild or interesting image to tie rather than just like a piece of paper that says the thing, although that is also a valid technique. Um, the idea is just that you're able to walk through that palace and connect things to connections that are already really powerful in your brain so that uh, you'll remember them a lot easier. And you can just sort of walk the path. I've, I've heard this is uh, really helpful for, for speeches, um, for public speaking, um, because you can sort of be like, oh yeah, I talk about this, and then you talk about this, and you just sort of hit the next thing on your path when you come up to the next point. Uh, and the last one, also very, very cool, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this, although I had heard about it before the class, um, is spaced repetition. So this is kind of flashcards, but with intervals in between them. Um, the idea is that, say I put a flashcard that says, um, Computers talk in binary, or computers talk in blank, and the other side says binary. Um, then I, I see I get that flashcard, but it's not as good for me to remember, like just look at the flashcard again. It's sort of like the recall thing. But in this case, it's better for me to remember it as I'm about to forget. So the way these programs work is like once you've said you answer and you're like, yes, I got it right, and it was easy to remember, then it's like, okay, then we'll show it to you in two days. So then in two days, if you're doing this every day, it will show you on the second day. And because you're about to forget it, and you pull it back into your working memory, then it's going to ingrain into your long-term memory even further. So some use like the Fibonacci sequence um, for, for how often they space uh, the repetition on the flashcards. Um, but sometimes it's just, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. But I mean, eventually, if you're, if you're using this regularly, especially for studying for, for exams and stuff, You'll get those three-month flashcards you haven't seen in three months, but that third month and you answer it correctly, it is really sticking in there for a long time. So um, I can cover an app that I've used in the past called Anki, A-N-K-I, um, that uh, is really helpful for building these flashcard sets. 
So I have the recap section here, but I think this should just be the quiz because I just talked about recall. And if I just tell you all the things we just talked about, uh, I think that's kind of doing a disservice. So I just might make this section the, uh, the quiz section. So I'm going to start up the quiz. I don't know if y'all were here last time, but, uh, it's kind of, oh gosh, you see the answers. Oh geez. No, no, no. So. Um, you can either use a laptop or a phone. You go to kahoot.it and you will be able to enter the lobby for this room. So there you go. It's at kahoot.it. Enter this pin. You can do this on your phone or a laptop. And then it's just going to have little, little answer squares on the bottom and, uh, you either, you know, it can be true or false. It could be, uh, there could be multiple answers. Uh, there's polls, uh, and there's always an excellent animated GIF to bring you joy. So don't get too distracted by the animated GIF. Make sure to answer the question. But, uh, awesome. Got eight people in already. Nine. Oh boy. Oh boy. And also, if you are playing along at home, uh, on my website, I showed there was a link to the kahoot.it uh, slides that you can do on your own. Um, so if you're watching this later, feel free to uh, start that qu pause this and start that quiz on your own. All right, I think that might be the crew. Ten peeps. Here we go. And I gave a little more time than last time. <sighs> I should wait until I'm motivated to really ingrain something. That's the best time when I'm motivated. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it then. That'll be fun. Yeah, that's that's false. Should just really just start putting in the time. It's uh, less fun, but often you'll find you'll have more fun and you'll be motivated more often if you just sort of jump into it. Next, who is uh, Barbara Oakley again? Uh, Barbara Oakley, that mysterious figure. Oh uh, yeah, she taught the thing uh, that uh, I'm mostly <laughs> taking for this content here. But uh, I highly recommend it. I, I have it in the links on my website, so you can check it out. Uh, next we have, ooh, multi-select. You can pick multiple options. Some intrinsic motivations coming from internally. My internal drives want these things. What do they want? Only you know the answer. And Brad Pitt. Clearly very motivated. Yeah. So it's uh, mostly knowing thyself and wanting to learn about the world. Uh, affording a sweet car and owning your own house. I mean, you could make the argument there, there's definitely intrinsic motivations there, but uh, they are sort of like external rewards for, for what you get for doing the thing. Oh, Nage Negehama taking the lead, but Plops is coming up. And this one is open-ended. There's a specific word for this mindset I'm looking for. This mindset avoids challenges, thinks effort is pointless, and criticism is an attack. There's a word that, I don't know, psychologists? I don't know, some, somebody started using this word. Yeah, <laughs> procrastinator is definitely definitely one, but uh, fixed fixed mindset was was the uh, was the term they gave for that one. All right, this one's a puzzle. These ones are weird. You're like sorting things into order. So first you want the look ahead answer, then you want recall, then you want the memory palace, then you want spaced repetition. These ones might need more time, but the idea is to like drag them into the order where it's look ahead, recall, memory palace, then spaced repetition. I feel like maybe I should give 60 seconds on this one next time. It doesn't have an option between 30 and 60, 
You gotta be quick on the draw. Looks like only one person... Ooh, two got in there. Uh, but yeah. Uh, look ahead was reading upcoming chapter headings. Recall is after absorbing. Spend time reviewing. Memory Palace is tying to concepts we know well. And Spaced Repetition flashcards at increasing intervals. Yeah, sorry, folks. I think, I mean, I guess I should do 60 seconds on those because you have to read them and then sort them and then the moving. Next time. Changing my perception can change how well I learn. Well, that sounds like hippie woo-woo, but is true. Yes, is true. Alrighty, got a f look, three questions left. There's another multi-select. So an internal locus of control. What would a person with an internal locus, would they blame it on Deborah or the cat? Or would they kind of be like, well, I did this, my ex did this. Or will they just be like, hey, that's not cool. And you can't tell me otherwise. Yeah, it looks like three people got the answers in. Let me know if this is going too fast. I, oh, I can't see the chat. Um, oh no, Green Jenny just sees colored squares with no questions and answers. Might be a browser um, ad block um, or something along those lines. Hopefully you can still see my screen and see you can sort of play along on your own. Oh, so it's not even on the app. You have to look at what's on the screen and then use your phone or laptop as the answerer. Thank you, Plop, for the clarification. I guess it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have made the jump either. Ooh, Ploppo, moving ahead. Sorry, Mom, too fast. Well, try to add more time. You're going to learn everything from me. Absolutely everything. Like, what else? What else could you possibly need? I mean, you've got me. What else could you need? Yeah! Oh my god, I'm so glad people are not going to learn everything from me. You don't want to learn everything from me. Alright, I think we got one real question left. Haley would be so jazzed if you... I mean, what, definitely one of these things Haley would be jazzed about. Oh yeah, there's a Discord. Haley forgot to mention that, but uh, might as well, right? You're already in a dozen. But, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think she would like... I mean, y y yes. Wait, oh, did nobody get points for the other ones? Oh, that was supposed to be points for everything. <laughs> Whoops! Uh, that's what you get for doing your Kahoot quiz at uh, midnight. All right, and the last one is a poll on what technique you are looking forward to trying. Because uh, I thought these were all pretty cool. I've definitely uh, gotten a lot of use out of Recall and Look Ahead, specifically. And Look Ahead was something I, I was doing sort of unintentionally when I was a kid, because I would kind of be bored and be like, oh, what's up here? And then I guess I accidentally trained myself to, uh... oh, no one else likes Look Ahead. But uh, yeah, they're all kind of cool. Whatever works for you, honestly. Uh, so that's that. Uh, on the third place to Dr. Mengele. Second place to Nagehama. And da 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 da. Lapo. Uh, congratulations, y'all. You earn eternal glory in Valhalla. Or something along those lines. So, uh, that's most of the class. I did just sort of want to talk about sort of what I'm trying to do. I, I forgot to mention the Discord. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention the Discord, but, uh, yeah. I, I just sort of want to make it easy for me to be available to someone if they just want to ask a quick question, and then other people can ask other people questions. I guess that's what the kids do nowadays. And, um, so... Something I took from the MIT Media Lab, who does a uh, courses on engineering and, and how to make good engineers. 
And the four alliterative, alliterative uh, pieces of that puzzle that they made were projects, which I did recommend at the beginning that those are available if you want to do them. I think it's one of the best ways to learn is to like utilize your learning for something and like make a thing, produce something out of your own hands. Um, secondly, to uh, cultivate passion for a thing. Uh, I, you know, I even found, you know, I've never really enjoyed football all that much, but I think it was like five Super Bowls ago. And I knew the rules of football. Like I, like I could, I, I knew the, you know, offsides and, you know, 10 yards to a first down, et cetera, so forth. But someone was like explaining to me the strategy of like the chess game of football and like why they were running a blitz when this and then this their type of offense is usually this and that's why they have the audibles to confuse them and like once someone explained to me the depth and I was understanding something then uh it really it really helped me appreciate the game and and I don't I wouldn't say I have passion for football but I'm certainly much more interested in a game than I ever would be before someone uh sort of broke that out for me and then the third thing they identified was having peers. So my idea is just, uh, yeah, I'd love for folks to talk and chat in the Discord, but also just know there are other people learning InfoSec, um, and the InfoSec community on Twitter is super passionate and curious and share a bunch. So the idea is to plug into some of these networks, and you'll sort of, you know, find your people and uh, enjoy it a bit more, I think. And lastly is play. Like, I hope I'm a little weird and that comes across. Um, but, uh, yeah, any anything you can do to sort of make your experience fun? <laughs> like, I think I think you can make some playful projects. Like, like sure, you might want to learn how to build a network security monitoring system. But uh, you might also want to set up a Raspberry Pi with a motion sensor over a doorway so it plays a Seinfeld guitar lick <laughs> when someone walks in the room like one of my friends did in college. So, I mean, I think it's just fun to think about how you can play in this space. And lastly, um, some links to check out. Uh, so the first one is a sort of distillation of Barbara Oakley's course that someone made on YouTube, but their production value is super top notch. And, uh, you know, they got, they got more time to produce their video than I do a live stream. So I highly recommend checking that out. Only 13 minutes of your day there. Secondly is a talk I really, really enjoyed called Hacking Passion from an InfoSec con and the thing in 2013. I found this when I was uh, studying InfoSec, and I really liked it a lot because it's sort of about how passion is kind of a curated thing. It's not necessarily just exists in and of itself without you sort of watering it and taking care of it and guiding it. So I really love that talk, and I think you will too. Last link we have here is another article by Azeria, which I recommended an article in the last episode, but this one is about the process of mastering a skill. And I've, I've taken notes on this article a few times just because she breaks down a lot of, uh, a little more in depth than, than what I'm doing here. I think it's just another system to approach systems. And I think her system is super top notch. So yeah, those are the links, and uh, like I showed at the beginning, uh, I also have potential research projects here. I have Barbara Oakley's class um, that you can take. Um, I recommended this workbook called Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, and it is a very cheesy title. Um, but I've, I've gone through uh, years and years of talk therapy which has mostly been cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like, oh, here's how you act and here's how you feel, like here's your thoughts and your feelings when this situation occurs. And then I was just kind of aware, but it didn't really change <laughs> my thoughts or feelings when those situations arose. I was just kind of aware of them and it, it really just didn't work that well for me. And then I also did uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is like a trauma processing uh therapy. And I found that pretty helpful, especially for acute trauma and sort of things that are difficult to think about, uh, without sort of, Ugh. but, uh, 
I just did the workbook for this one, um, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and basically its thing is observing, reflecting upon, and ultimately changing your narrative that you have about your own life. Um, and I found this super duper helpful because like even just writing it out, I was like the words I used to describe myself, it was like I was limiting myself with the words that were clearly my narrative. And so we talked a bit in the beginning about learning mindset and, uh, that workbook was super helpful for me. So if, if, if that's your bag, uh, would be worth checking out. And lastly, I mentioned the app Anki. Uh, it has an Android version, I think, called Anki Droid, and an iOS version. Um, but basically it's just spaced repetition. And, uh, if you're studying for the CompTIA A+, Network+, or Security+, which are the certs I generally recommend if you're not super familiar with computers, and Security+, if you just want to learn A+, and Network+, and make sure you know that stuff. Um, that's what I did just cause I didn't have the money to take the certs for A plus and network plus. So I just made sure I knew it and then did security plus, but spaced repetition flashcards for that stuff. Super duper helpful for memorizing a lot of information that, uh, three years later, I probably should have used more spaced repetition because a lot of that has fallen out of my brain, but I, it, it that particular certification helps understand the sort of layers of the security organization and uh, the, the types of things and concepts you'll be dealing with and like the types of things you'll need to study and learn about. So I still highly recommend those and uh, doing spaced repetition while you study those is going to help you keep it in there real nice and good. So that's kind of all the goodies I have for y'all this week. I kept it at 55 minutes. Cha-ching! Uh, Amy has taken her first practice test for the GSEC, which is a tough one, 68%. So definitely more to learn before practice test too. But yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can take some of these techniques and use that with your, your studying to, uh, bump that number up, keep all those, uh, keep all those concepts floating around in the brain a little easier for easy access. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm thinking at the end here, I might try and trim the lecture just another, like, five minutes, so at the end I could open up the Discord voice chat and, you know, beam people in to just have a quick little Q&A type thing, and that's kind of... Uh, the fourth class in each season, the fourth episode of each season, is just going to be a chit chit chat along with like an activity or some sort of thing to get us going. So that's definitely what those will be. We'll just be, uh, I think we'll we'll just have people in the Discord, and then we can thread you in here, and then uh, yeah, we can chit chat. But uh, I hope that was fun new information that you learned about, and I hope you uh, like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, just make sure to come back. And next week we're talking about habit building and uh, meditation, because I feel like uh, that's one of those things everyone harps on about, like, oh, diet, exercise, meditation, and it's like, unfortunately, even though those are the hardest things to sort of make habits, they are super duper helpful for sort of aligning other areas of your life. So just some of my things I've found along the way is what, uh, what we'll get up to. So thanks for joining. I will catch you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.